Have you had a frost? And we're, we've, been, we've been very busy in the laboratory. You know, new things that we're trying to implement so we can, right. we can grow what we can offer to people. And where, where is the, uh, so, where's the furthest place that you've sent a kit this week? Oh, dear. I think we just sent a whole bunch out to, um, to Australia. Australia. Australia is one of our customers. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, they're very into organic. Yes. And their soil is very poor. And they have a lot of salinization. Yeah. Uh, their, their soil is being, um, it gets dry. And then evidently it, it absorbs ocean water. Really? Huh. Never. So it brings the salt in from the ocean because of the dryness of the climate. I never heard that. I never heard that. And their, their soil get, becomes very saline. Hmm. And so they're very into using mycorrhizal fungi. Yes which really improves the ability of, of plants to survive under such conditions. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and of course, they've and um, the big fires, of course, causing lots of uh, change. Mm -hmm. We're not quite sure what all of those fires do to the microbes in the soil and the soil food web clearly is impacted. Uh, so I'm sure that the micro biometer can be used for and testing and we are seeing, um, you know, now in uh, agronomists being interested in the test. Mm -hmm. uh, agronomists have traditionally used laboratory tests. Right. What choice? So they're used to just collecting the soil and sending it into a lab and, and getting the results along, you know, with recommendations for treatment and everything. Mm -hmm. But there's there's now a big movement, evidently, you know, with people trying to, uh, you, you know, realizing that the, a lot of the information they're getting from conventional lab tests is not really helping them in terms of going regenerative and, and you know, doing improving the, the health of their soil that they're working on and everything like that. And they are uh, they, they are converting. Well, let me tell you one of the which is exciting for us. Yeah, which is very exciting. One of the, one of the experiences, you know, as you know, I've, I've written more than just soil books. And so my fourth book, which is on auto flowering cannabis, I had somebody write me, uh, and it was sort of in relationship to the, to, to the idea. They were testing their soil. They were doing a conventional test. I hadn't gotten them converted to the microbiometer yet. And, and by the time they got the results back, the plant had gone from from basically germination to flower. It took that long, uh, so the test was completely useless. Whereas, of course, your test can be done right there. And and for cannabis growers, fungal uh, bacterial rate ratio. Whew, I mean, the fact that you can do it right there, five minutes, have it right in front of you, no, not even twenty four hour wait, is just simply simply beyond beyond belief. So. Um, all right, so Australia, excellent. I know you're sending a lot to India. Uh, what's what's the problem with the Indian soils that you're getting getting reported? Well, the Indians have a big problem with arsenic in their soil. Arsenic. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Arsenic is a huge problem in India, and a lot of their water supplies are actually contaminated with arsenic, and they 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 have to be it has to be treated before they they actually should be drinking it. Interesting. What? So yeah. Well, of course. Yeah. And of course, you know, India's, you know, been a big civilization, you know, mm -hmm. for a long, long time. Longer than so those soils have been, you know, gardened forever. Yes. And people don't have a lot of soil. They have a couple of acres and they've got to feed a family for a year on a couple of acres. So they have their work cut out for them. Well, one of the one of the reasons why the soil food web is so good for that kind of a situation, particularly arsenic, is uh, 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 there was a discovery at the University of Arizona in Tucson that the plants put out in, amongst their exudates cleating agents that tie up arsenic so that it can't get into the plant. 
uh, which is just mind boggling to me. So, so what, what an amazing thing that, that there is so much emphasis on going organic in a place like India, which there is this, as you know, great, great fight against Monsanto and et cetera, et cetera, and fights about using glyphosate and all those. Well, one, one of the big, yeah, one of the big reasons <clears throat> for going organic is to cut back on the cost of all these uh, fertilizers and pesticides that have to be used. Because once you're using, you know, you know, conventional mineral fertilizers, you have to use pesticides because you've killed the plant's immune system. Yeah, and it's dependent on the soil microbes for its immune system. Right, and and, and just just as I always do, trying to compare the the cellular system to our big macular system, the same thing happens to the farmer. The farmer becomes connected to the supplier. And, you know, as soon as the, yeah, so it's a terrible, terrible thing. That's why regenerative, organic, soil food web uh, uh, farming is the only way to go. And of course, uh, a quick commercial right before we begin, the, the, the microbiometer uh, or the microbarometer, if, if you want to call it that, the microbiometer uh, certainly uh, I don't care. <laughs> helps people do this stuff. What do you, how do you, what do you call it? The micro microbiometer yeah yeah biometer micro you know biometer. so makes sense well what do you say we uh we start uh and chit chat a little bit about today's topic which is, is it time is it time to start i think it's eleven fifty-eight. no maybe not all right we'll wait two more minutes because because we're very punctual well, wait wait a minute or two i don't know i don't know whether younger uh one of the things that i would like to start off with is you know there's very little academic work done on cannabis because it's off the screen. Well, not, you not know, because it's been off the screen. It's been on the screen, but studies. it's allowed to do it because uh, of the, the structure of the laws and regulations in the country that if you are researching cannabis, it had to be to show a negative impact. You couldn't get approval for showing that cannabis was beneficial for your health, but you could get approval uh, to get cannabis to test and to run the tests to show that it was bad for your health. And so uh, until we get the changes in, 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 uh, in, in the laws, it's going to continue to be that way in this country, but not in other places like Israel. So, uh, but that's, that's why it's been, on. but you're right. There's been no great research done by certified there's a you know so so like when when you inspired me to kind of look into you know why um cannabis that's grown in soil is so much more flavorful than cannabis that's not grown organic we had to go both of us and look at other crops to see why organics actually have, you know, more flavor. Right. And, and you and know, it, one of the things is essential oils and things that are grown. And, and there's been a lot, quite a bit of work done on essential oils, you know, for uh, the flavor oils and things that, that are grown in plants, which, you know, you assume can be, you know, you, you can think it's the same thing for cannabis as it is for, you know, for, for the oils that they're growing, for the aromatic oils that are being raised. And, and they can raise the level of oils and the flavor like 300% going organic and using, you know, uh, mycorrhizal fungi. So it, it's actually very, very amazing. Sure. And, and of course, I don't think we're, we're, I, well, let's put it this way. There's no question that the organic system feeds the plant in, in, in the natural way and that what you get when you use the natural system is, is a plant that is at its peak in terms of what the plant is there. For. And so its taste, its flavor, its fruit, whatever it happens to be, comes out at the top level. Uh, one well, it turn, turns out that that a lot of the flavonoids and, and the polyphenols are made 
the, which are the compounds that give organic produce and organic oils their flavor. Right. And in okay. The, in the, are, and are, are, are made when the plant is under stress and when its own immune system is working together with the microbes. That's right. And, and the first thing that struck me when I went to cannabis conferences with you was people having, you know, having cannabis in, in containers and saying, smell them. And the smell can be so different from different brands. And it, it's so lovely, you know. Oh, it's it's really astounding. I I, I was like, whoa. <laughs> wait, wait a minute. Where were you in high school? Oh no, I, I won't go there. Uh, you're absolutely right. And so there. Are, so so. Uh, but let's go back to that stress comment because you you said something that's very important that a lot of cannabis growers don't understand. And and you know this because people people will send you, for example, a product that contains a tremendous amount of terpenes, and they want you to test it to see whether or not it teams with microbes, you know. And so you run a microbiometer test on it. Um, but it really has nothing to do with what is inside the plant. In other words, you can't put terpenes in the soil and expect those terpenes to go into the plant and give the plant flavor. And I think too many people who are cannabis growers, particularly beginner growers, think that that's possible, that you can feed the plant terpenes and get better terpenes as a result. That's not how the system works. Um, what, as you indicated, what happens is the plant has to produce those terpenes inside the plant. And what causes them to do so is at least in part by a stress, which is something that we can easily cause the plant to have, right? Yeah, well, I mean, I think a good analogy is we know that children who play with other children or in daycare have healthier immune systems than children who aren't exposed to, to childhood diseases. They don't have allergies anywhere near the level. They don't get autoimmune diseases anywhere near the same level. So it's not like they're sick all the time, although children who are with other children get more colds and things like that. But in that stress, okay, but that's it, exercising the immune system of the child. Yeah. And you must exercise the immune system in order to make it strong. It has to learn. And the same thing is true for a plant. It needs a certain amount of stress, okay, and under that stress, it makes antioxidants, which are the polyphenols, which you talk about all the time, which your prenes are part of those. Okay. More than 20,000 different kinds of polyphenols are made by plants. Okay, And the USDA does not consider these as nutrients, even though, right, they say the nutrient level of organic and non-organic foods is the same. Yeah, it's crazy. But all you're counting is nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, etc. They're not counting the fact that these compounds are anti-cancerous. They give the flavor. So if you know people eat who eat organics tend to eat more fruits and vegetables, and that's because they taste better. I mean, in every single test, people say. They taste better. Their flavor is a lot better. They smell better. Okay, so it's this. It's that you know you have to do that. And then the other thing that like that blew my mind was the fact that the sap in all these plants contains the my you know po populations of the microbes that are in the soil. So these microbes don't stay in the soil. When the plant has a disease or something, it invites in a microbe that makes an antibiotic right. that this plant needs. Right. right. And I, you know, I, I talk about that uh, in, in Teaming with Nutrients. Uh, and, and, you know, I think people, people need to see this picture. See that, folks? That's the cell, that's the cell wall 
it's not solid. It's not a brick. That area is not sterile. It's full of microbes. You know, and had this book been written maybe this year as opposed to six or seven years ago, the, the pictures would include the microbes because we'd have, we'd have the ability to, to, to be able to show that. I mean, then it's sort of, this is the cellulose when you get close in the cell wall. Look at all those pore spaces. Those all contain microbes, fungi and bacteria. And as you and I have talked, those bite microbes, guess how they communicate? They communicate in terpenes. They put out terpenes to communicate with each other, which is, whoa, <laughs> you know, uh, you got to sit back. And Mind think, whoa, this is amazing. Okay. You know, but people always wonder, well, why did he, why did you write this book? I mean, I wrote this book because I, I, I needed to know the information on how do plants eat, but, but it, it's, it ties in, all of my books tie in with the soil because that's what makes it work. Now, I want to go back to the, to the concept of stress that you point out. Um, uh, because I think, I think again, we tend, to, we tend to look at plants as humans, and we think of them as humans. You know, oh, it's a dumb plant, it can't run, you know, doesn't have a brain, blah, blah, blah. The concept of stress really translates into signaling. The plant's stress is a way to, to, to trigger the plant to signal that something is happening, either in the soil or in the plant itself, or even in the atmosphere. So for example, this I find so mind boggling, uh, and then I'm gonna let you speak because everybody can hear me anytime, but we can't hear you. When a tree is in a forest, it can put out terpenes to create, to seed clouds, to create a cloud cover so that the clouds will reflect the light so that the trees grow better. What? They use terpenes to seed clouds? I mean, this is mind boggling stuff. And we don't think about this stuff because we just don't. Cannabis growers think about this stuff and think a little bit more than other people, probably because you know, people are a little altered and thinking about these things, but these plants are amazing. And that concept of stress, when you stress the root membrane, if, it, you know, a calcium signal goes out throughout the entire plant. And a, another, another picture that I always go to in the, in, in the book is there are two different pathways in, in, in a plant. One pathway goes from into the root and through the cells so each cell is connected and you go through the, but the other one goes through all of the cell walls. It goes around the insides of the cells. And again, all of these microbes are in that area doing all this kind of, and the stress is going on in the inside. Uh, whoa, and producing stuff, even probably producing stuff inside those walls to re react and interact with the microbes that are there. Well, you know, a lot of the the um, compounds that are made are antioxidants. So they they act as antioxidants. So they're protecting the plant. And uh, if you're actually eating organic foods, okay, or doing things like that, those antioxidants actually seem to have a profound effect on the uh, microbes in your own gut. Right. Okay, so you know they they can they're still communicating. Right, right. Um, when 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 you eat them, I mean, I th I think one of the things that fascinates me about the cannabis industry, it is because it was kind of outlawed. They had to be independent thinkers. Sure. You know, it, it's not like there are people who take follow the rules like a lot of the USDA farmers are, you know, they get a, a prescription from a lab. These guys were forced to think for themselves. And, and, and as such, I think in, in a lot of ways, they're, they're, they're way ahead. Absolutely. You know, oh, no question. The best, the best growers, gardeners, farmers in the world are cannabis growers. 
hands down, without question, no argument from anybody. Grape growers beat all sorts of people. And, and they understand that growing is a three-legged stool. You know, it's the sunlight. We know that. Uh, and it's, it's the genetics of the plant. We know that. You have a bad plant genetics. Uh, you're not going to get these uh, trich the trichome production. You're not going to get the production of the of the terpenes that you want. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, and then the third thing, of course, is the soil. So what's in that soil ends up ha giving the it's the it's the factory materials that allow the plant to make what it makes. The the analogy I use is cholesterol. Nobody, you know, we don't, we produce cholesterol. Do we eat it? It's produced in our bodies. Uh, you know, the, the, the same thing with the plant. The plant can produce these terpenes. They, they bring it in from the soil and they produce it. Uh, and it happens to be actually a lot of these terpenes are produced the same pathway uh, in our bodies that, that I think cholesterol is produced. So uh, there's probably a bigger correlation there than I know. But the, the point is, if you don't have good stuff in your soil, the plant can't make what it needs. And if you don't have enough of it in your soil, the plant can't make enough of what it needs. And that's where your instrument comes, comes into play. Uh, so so it's, it's, it's just an, an amazing way to, to, to take a look at a plant uh, in the same way that we look at ourselves. We always say the human body is mostly bacteria. Right? What is you know this? More, more not 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 by weight, but by number of cells, we're more bacteria. Right. Uh, you know, and it's, it may might make sense to start looking at plants in the same way. They're not just cellulose uh, and cellular material uh, and systolic liquids. They're also microbes that are all part of this little sort of living living thing. Uh, it's it's a new way of looking at plants that most people don't don't have. Cannabis growers probably do, if no other reason than they're growing something that's ingested into their system and they want to know what's going into their system. Yeah, I mean, to a large extent, what I think the microbial population tells you is the nutrient level in your soil. Because the nutrient level has to be adequate in your soil me, and it has to be balanced. Let me interrupt you for a second if it smells good. I, I want to put that caveat in there because I remember when we first started talking about this, one of the, one of the gurus out there said, this, this doesn't work because you can have high microbial levels and it can be full of E. coli. Um, and, and, and I think the answer to that is if it smells good, aerobic, mm -hmm. then what you say applies. If it smells bad, you can still have a very, you know, you can have a high microbiomass with a bad smelling batch of soil, right? Well, actually, I've never tested bad soil. I'm, I'm you know, we should try. I should go, go try and find some. If you have some bad soil, send it to me. Well, wait a minute. I understand that you've got some ponies. Yes. Well, maybe you should just try some of that manure. Yeah, I'm sure it would test very high. Well, we we make uh, compost out of that manure. Yeah, I understand. And you can take anaerobic materials and convert it into aerobic materials. Once it's aerobic, the E. coli is you know the, it's the anaerobic side of it that 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 uh, that doesn't make any sense. But but anyway, you, yeah. All I'm just saying is that if yeah. you're using if someone comes up to you and says, "Nah, that could be full of E. coli," the answer to that is if it smells good. I'm pretty sure your soil is good and you can test it with a microbiometer and know that you're getting a, 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 a test of a good thing. But Well, the soil can test fine, can smell fine and, and have very low yeah. microbes. I mean, we, we see if you're using mineral fertilizers, rarely do we see soils that hit 100 micrograms per, per gram of, of microbial biomass. And you know, and also what you see is no structure to the soil whatsoever. So in those fields, you see a lot of erosion and stuff like that because they're not, 
producing the uh, the compounds that allow the microbes to stick to the soil, right. which is what gives the soil its structure. Right, right, right. No, but yeah, hey, don't don't let me confuse you. I mean, my only my only point was that the soil smells good, and you get a high micro. Or you know, if the soil smells good, you've got aerobic soil. You don't have to worry about E. coli. You don't have to worry about yes. It, then, if you have high microbes, right. you you know your soil is good. Well, yeah, it smells. That that well, okay. it, it smells good. But you um, took that manure and did a, a, a test on it, and it it doesn't smell good. It, you know, anaerobic. It's going to have a very high number. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. But anyway, I interrupted you. Uh, so if you have no, that's that's fine. I mean. One thing, you know, to, to go philosophical or something, yeah. you know, people who've had, who've lived through stress are more interesting. <laughs> How do you mean? Well, I mean, they have different perspectives. You know, once you've been through a stress or something, it makes you more sensitive to what other people are going through, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, people think you don't want stress. You don't want too much stress. Yeah. But, you know, we all have the stress of life. And, and, and living through stress makes people very interesting. Some of the most interesting people have lived through, you know, tremendously stressful times and situations. Yeah, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. And it also probably makes them uh, more resourceful and resilient. So, so for example... Uh, if you were growing cannabis back in the day and you were always worried about the feds or the or the police knocking on your door, you could bet you were going to develop the best growing situation you could and that you were going to waste your time growing lousy crops. That stress caused you to be a better grower. Uh, I, mean, I think you've got a point there. I think a lot of things in life, uh, you're dull if you don't, if you haven't gone through stress, you're dull. Uh, yes they, yeah so i mean it you know it's it's an interesting it, it's an interesting concept okay, my wife that, uh, happy. that the plant makes these these oils uh when it's under stress yeah. to help it you know compensate for the stresses it's under and those flavonoids and terpenes and you know that whole polyphenol family is very very good for you know, for you and, and is what gives flavor to your things. As, as, as does some of the microbes that actually make their way into the oils. So it'd be interesting to look at the microbes that are actually in the oils or the breakdown products of the microbes that actually make it into the oils. It would be. And I've also wanted to know the correlation. And again, this is something we can do. I should do it here because I've got a bricks meter between bricks and a and your uh, uh, you know the reading on your microbiometer, BRICS is a measurement of the sugar uh, in 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 the material. And so, uh, if you take a, a you know a, a organically grown tomato versus a conventionally grown tomato and measure the BRICS level, it's higher in the organically grown because there's more sugar in the organically grown. Uh, generally, and and I wonder I wonder how that correlates to the thing. These are all. This is such a new instrument. That it's just the, the comparisons and the the workings making things work together. It's just it, it, I think it's it's this is what makes it so exciting. It's so much fun to work with you on this stuff. Uh, uh, you know, when we were talking about fungal bacteria, I remember when you first came up with the microbiometer, and we talked about, and I kept saying to you, and I'm sure you kept saying. Fungal bacteria. We all want to know fungal bacteria. Remember that? Uh, and Jane, mm -hmm. oh yeah, we well, need a fungal bacteria. You know, so a food web test. Whew. You know, who who knew? Who knew? And now we're seeing that there is so much more information coming about about the fungal component. Uh, for example, the article that I sent you a couple of weeks ago that we were going to talk about two weeks ago when we didn't get tripped up on this thing. Thank you, Brady, for helping us. Uh, the idea that a fungus now they know used to be people thought when I wrote Teaming with Fungi that the fungus could could produce an organic compound that would go into, you know, that would 
that would go into the the uh, uh, the plant as opposed to an inorganic molecule, which is normally what's required to go inside a plant. Now we know that in some instances, grapes, I think we were talking about, the fungal, the mycorrhizal fungal goes into the xylem. Was it the xylem? I mean, it was living in there. Yeah. Going on. Xylem up, flow them down. Yeah. Well, it went into one. Yeah, it goes up. And, and, the, and the fungi actually go into the grape, okay? And the flavor in the grape is conferred by the fungus that grows in the soil. So we went to a, um, a vineyard right near here one day in, in early spring, and I got soil there. And their ratio of, um, of, of AMF to the, the fungal bacterial ratio at the beginning of spring was over 10 to 1. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. There, yeah. Well, it's such, you know, so it, it's an old, it's an old, it's an old vineyard yeah. near here. And that, that number, that, that, I mean, that makes sense. Uh, uh, it, it's a perennial stays in the ground all the time, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but again, the, the, the concept of fungal bacteria, we thought was just soil. Now, you know, it's moved to the plant. I don't even want to get into the idea because I'm not capable of doing it, but I mean, you know, the whole plant cannabis extracts, uh, oh my God, versus, whew, you know, is any of this stuff impacted by the bacteria and the fungi? Simply, simply amazing. We should do some tests. I will I will try to do some tests. I, I had a little phobia for a while this summer of using my microbiometer because I didn't want to run out of cards. And then I remembered you sent me another box of them. Uh, so now my wife, you, my, you should have as many, you can have as many as you want, I, you know, now my, yeah. my wife is, yeah. Judith has learned how to, how to do the test herself. Uh, and so we're, we're happily testing away, but uh, I did send you some soils from Alaska. And uh, I noticed that on my table, I left one of them here that I didn't send. I hope I sent you enough. Um, and I hope the United States. Okay. Was it, did it go to you or went to this other gentleman, I guess, but. It goes, it goes to us. Okay. So we've been running the, we've been validating, we validated our test against microscopy. Well, let's, but the, please, um, explain what, the. Explain pardon? what that means. So, so I'll explain it. So what you're doing is you're, the, the microbiometer is so new that, that what you are doing is, is ensuring that it validates, its results are the same or better than the results of other ways of testing soil. So the Haney test, uh, and so one of the tests people use is microscopy. They look in the microscope, uh, either under a grid, et cetera, et cetera. So, okay. Well, um, you know, we've been validating against carbon, the carbon fumigation assay, okay? We've collected soils now from all over the United States, and our correlation with that is excellent, and we'll be publishing that soon. And I had missed some Alaskan soils. I got soils from every place else on the continent, but I didn't get any Alaskan soils. So you've, you're sending that so I can say, okay, I've got soils from everywhere now, and we've been working with the University of Tennessee, who's been running those tests. But the carbon fumigation test, there's 2 million articles, use it to validate that soil is healthy by the amount of microbes, is $500. So it's offered now by only a couple of labs, and it's used by greenhouse people who have to show that they're buying sterile soil. So they run the carbon fumigation assay to validate that their soil is supposedly sterile. But of course, it's almost impossible to make soil really sterile. These microbes have outwitted humans for ages. <laughs> and they probably did arrive here from other planets. You know, so. Wow. We can yeah, well, they probably did, you know. You're right. Look, look right. what they, they just discovered Venus. You're breaking up. Look what they discovered at, in Venus. They, uh, uh, you know, now they now they know uh, maybe life 
uh, in Venus. So phew, the idea that, that we have inter, interspace, interstellar makes a lot of sense. But um, uh, I want you to finish up, though, on, on what you were saying in terms of the, uh, the, 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 the testing around the country. What are you going to prove at the end? What do you, what, uh, you know, well, one of the problems just, yeah. is that there's so, there's so many tests. Maybe we should talk about this sometime. They all measure something different. Okay. okay. So if you're talking about the Haney test, respiration assay that people do, that's measuring activity. Okay. And the mistakenly, people think, and have been led to think that it actually tells you how many microbes are there. Mm -hmm. But let's say you wanted to measure how many people were in, in a space by how much carbon dioxide they made. Okay. So you could have 10 people in, in a room exercising. They'd be making a lot of carbon dioxide. If you had 10 people sitting in a lecture, yeah. they'd be making very little carbon dioxide. So, you know, usually in the literature, that's just used to measure stress. So if you have microbes that are in a soil that has like a pH of four, the carbon di they have to work a lot harder to stay alive because their enzymes aren't as efficient mm -hmm. at those low pHs. So they're making a lot more carbon dioxide than, than microbes that are that are in a more neutral pH level. If there are toxins, then you see that the that the level the microbial biomass level is high too. But um, you know, you had me talk to a friend of yours just a couple of weeks ago, and he he uses the um, he does mediation mm -hmm. for toxins, and he puts down bacteria that will eat the toxins or like like petroleum. Mm -hmm. And he wants to see that the activity goes way up right. once he puts down his microbes that are supposed to eat that petroleum. So yes, he needs that. Right. He needs that, that number. But, you know, some of our agronomists are, are saying that the microbiometer is just as good for, you know, looking at at whether corn needs a side dressing. That means it's running low on nitrogen. Be low in the soil, you're going to have low. And it makes so much sense. I mean, when, when I test my cannabis plants, when I test my annual flowers, you can tell, you can tell the ones that are doing well visually. I'm, I'm an experienced enough gardener to know that. Uh, and then you look at the numbers and they, they correlate. I mean, you go, whoa, uh, it, it, it really is something. Uh, it's a, it's just an amazing, amazing tool. And I, I, I understand the, the guy who spoke with you. I mean, you know, the idea of using the Haney test for activity, but my God, to have to spend 500 bucks into weight. Uh, there are other tests that he should be using, but um, uh, that's the other thing. The instant, of the test is what counts so much. Um, so, so I know I, we'll probably get to the point where we got to get get going. But I know you keep working on getting new stuff in there uh, and 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 whatnot. Uh, and I know that more and more people are using the test. At what point do you think someone's going to say, "This is it. This is it. We're the United States Department of Agriculture." we're officially endorsing this project. I mean, you know, we've got to get to that point. Uh, and again, we, we need the stress of everybody who's got a microbiometer to put more stress on the uh, FDA and, and powers that be so that this test becomes a standard because I think that's ultimately what we want to see is, is to be able to look up a number in an area you know, and say, like we look up pH and say, okay, I'm in a good zone here and my plants are going to do well. And I don't need to add either organic or inorganic fertilizers. Well, I, I think an, an interesting concept that we're working on now that is that to some extent, 
the fertility of your soil depends on this, you know, the actual soil itself. Okay. And. Whoa, where'd you go? I lost, I lost her. Well, I guess our half hour is up folks. So we're going to be back uh, pretty soon. Uh, hey, I see. White Coat Services just joined. You want to know if that ponytail? Yeah, not a ponytail yet, but it will be. Uh, this is always a pain. Let's see. 